Welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast, helping you propel your writing business to a whole new level. And now, here's your host, Ed Gandia. Hey there, and thank you for joining me for episode 66 of the High Income Business Writing Podcast. My name is Ed Gandia, and this is the podcast for business writers and copywriters who want to take their writing businesses to the six-figure level or the part-time equivalent. You can find detailed show notes for this episode by going to b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 66. You know, I've always believed that there is a magnificent force out there playing a very active role in our lives. And when I went solo back in 2006, I became even more convinced that we can all tap into this source and call it God, call it the universe, whatever you want to call it. And we can tap into the source to help us manifest amazing things. And I've started feeling this way strongly when I went out on my own because things started happening to me that I never thought possible. And and in fact, I I really believe that if we want to accomplish anything out of the ordinary, we have to employ the help of this force. We can't do it alone. And when you're self-employed and you're truly putting yourself out there, you need all the help you can get. There's no safety net. There's no right, no weekly paycheck, no sick leave, no vacation time, no stock options. And you know, we talked about this uh, extensively last December in episodes 33 and 34, which discussed in length the spiritual side of freelancing, where I deviate from many of the teachings uh, on the subject is that my belief on this universal force is not based purely on faith. There, there are too many instances in my life where I saw undeniable proof that God or the universe, or whatever you feel comfortable calling it, is present in every aspect of my life, helping me accomplish great things that I couldn't accomplish entirely on my own. I've studied the science behind these ideas and learned that there's a whole branch of science called quantum physics that explains why this craziness happens. And the interesting thing is is we're just now beginning to understand from a scientific standpoint what I've just described. We're now beginning to understand that this is not new age, woo-woo garbage. There's real science behind it. And I think it's going to transform our thinking here in the next couple of decades. And we're going to be living in a very, very different world. But anyway, A little over a year ago, I ran across Pam Grout's book called E Squared. And when I read it, I was fascinated by it, first of all. And as I read it and started to try the experiments that she talks about and she gives you to do yourself at home, I began to see this science in action. I loved Pam's book so much that I recently invited her to the show And she gracefully accepted. And Pam is not just an international best-selling author. She's also a freelance writer and has been a freelance writer for more than 25 years. So I thought, you know what? Who better to bring into the show to talk about the subject than someone who is in our shoes, someone who's been out there for a long time doing what you and I are doing. So in this episode, she goes through a series of very simple do-it-yourself experiments you can conduct on your own, at home, in your office, that will prove to you that your thoughts do indeed create your reality. I think this is a very important discussion. I love it that you know we're talking about this again, this time right before the holidays in December as we close out the year and as we start thinking about 2015. I hope you give it some, some, some time, some thought. I hope you keep an open mind through this. But you know what? Even the skeptics, even those of you who are really skeptical about this idea, I think you'll walk away some, with some very useful stuff. And I think you'll uh, be able to put some of these ideas in, into practice and see for yourself that there is something here, something that we really need to pay attention to. So anyway, with that, let's get right to the interview. Hey, Pam, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I love talking to other freelancers. Well, you're, you're one of us. And, um, you know, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm honored to have you on the show. You have a, 
an incredible message that you're sharing with the world right now through some of your books. And I tell you, it hit me like immediately. It's like, okay, I, I, I have to get Pam on the show because this is something that my audience really needs to to hear um, as you know they're they're out there facing the typical obstacles that we all face as freelancers, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, we're all in this boat together. So why don't we start uh, by telling us a little bit about your writing career? So tell us how you got started, what type of writing you've done, uh, types of clients you've worked with, and so forth. That way, folks have an idea of you know who you are and, and your background. Okay, well, I've been a freelance writer for, gosh, I've lost track, but a good 25 years, and I've been completely on my own for at least 25 years. I know it's at least that long because my daughter is 21, and I know I was doing it before she was born. So, But anyway, so I have really covered the gamut when it comes to freelance writing. As I was just telling you, I've got 17 books out, so I've, you know, I've published books. But I've also um, written for many magazines. I, I do a lot of travel writing. So some of the magazines that I have published with, um, Travel and Leisure, a lot of the in-flight magazines. I write a lot these days for Huffington Post, Men's Journal, CNN. Um, I just last weekend was doing a story for People Magazine. So I write for a lot of um, big national magazines and, and then blog posts or websites, I guess you'd call Huffington Post. Um, but... Um, so anyway, I have done a lot of that. I have, over the years, you mentioned copywriting. I've also done a little bit of copywriting, although not for years and years and years. I once wrote a, um, what was it, a, like a video series or something for somebody that was, you know, teaching business classes or something like that. So, I mean, I guess the one of the secrets to my success is I'm very versatile. You know, I've, I've done a lot of different things. And I love writing. I just absolutely think it's the most fun thing in the world. In fact, I often have to pinch myself like, wow, do I get paid to do this thing that I would do anyway, even if I wasn't getting paid? I mean, I love what I do. I feel so blessed that, you know, that I've been able to, you know, make a good living doing something that is so much fun to me. Wow. And, and so besides 17 books, it sounds like you're still pretty busy writing articles for a lot of different publications. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I stay for days. Lately, I've been doing quite a bit of speaking just because, you know, when you have a best-selling book like E Squared, a lot of people think you're also a speaker, so they ask you to come and, you know, give presentations. Tomorrow, for example, I'm heading up to British Columbia. I'm doing a, a day-long presentation with a Canadian trainer who is um, – he, he's a trainer to like a lot of the Olympic athletes up in Canada. So maybe I will tell them to make sure the U.S. team wins, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, you probably have freelancers from all over the world. Oh, my so gosh. We won't, I, a we lot of Canadians. Kind of. <laughs> I got a lot of Canadians in my audience, so you got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't do that anyway. We should all give our best at all times. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what we need to be doing. So let's let's talk a little bit now about kind of that spiritual journey because one thing that was obviously apparent when I started reading E Squared was that you embarked on a spiritual journey pretty early in your career. At least that was my impression. So I'm curious what led you down that path. What 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 was the spark? Well, you know, it's interesting you ask that because a friend who lives in my town, we're both freelance writers, and we often talk about how freelance writing is a very spiritual journey because, A, you're sort of putting yourself out there. You're not exactly sure what's going to come back. Um, You're taking a risk. You're not doing things the normal way. So it is um, a very spiritual thing. But as for me, I've always been on a spiritual path. I mean, from the time I was a little kid, my father was a Methodist minister, although I've strayed quite a bit from that particular path. But, um, and, I, and I also think I mentioned at E-squared that I appointed God, or some people call it the universe. I call it the field of infinite potentiality, the divine buzz, as the CEO of my career, of my freelance writing career, from, you know, from the time I began. It's like it was pretty apparent to me that I wasn't going to be able to do this on my own, <laughs> and I needed a little help. So my CEO has always been the universe, or, you know, this bigger, this bigger source that's out there. So, um, so, yeah, and I think also... And Another thing that's pretty interesting to me, people sometimes ask me, well, you know, you're a writer, you know, and I've done, you know, pretty traditional writing. I used to write for a newspaper. Um, And, you know, how did you get into the spiritual stuff? As I said, I've always been spiritual, but I think what happens when you're a writer, you know, you can feel that thing when you get plugged into this higher source. It's almost like you're channeling. I mean, that sounds kind of woo-woo, but you know that what you're, you know, the words that are coming out of you are 
things that are important that people need to hear. And so it's almost like you're not writing. You're just like the secretary writing it down. And I think when you reach that state, and I mean, some, you know, I think writers often do, they realize, wow, there's something bigger going on out here. So it's not that big of a leap, you know, to get into a spiritual path or to, you know, think in terms of spirit, spirituality and creativity. In fact, one of my books is called Art and Soul about creativity and spirituality. And to me, they're actually joined at the hip. They're, they're kind of the same thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I tell you, it's funny that you say that because I did become a heck of a lot more spiritual when I went out on my own in 2006. I mean, it was night and day. And I, I now that you say that, I do, I do agree with you that you, I put myself out there, right, and uh, took some huge risk, got way out of my comfort zone, and I really don't think it was all me. You know, it, it wasn't just me who made, who created the success. And right. It just, you feel it, you know it. And you know what you said about the whole creativity thing um, reminds me of Elizabeth, um, uh, oh, what's her name? The, uh, the the lady who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, oh, Elizabeth Gilbert, yeah. Gilbert, yeah, with her TED Talk, right? She, I mean, that was that was her talk, if you've, if you've seen it or heard it. Uh, it was it was amazing. You're right. You, as a writer, sometimes things come out of you. You go, I, I don't know where that came from, but that's really good. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, and it, yeah, that's where you're going to get all the good stuff. In fact, the harder we try to do it ourselves, the more messed up we get. I mean, the more we can surrender to this bigger thing. I believe we're all connected to this big giant force. I mean, some people call it God, but you know, but this energy force, and that it conforms to our beliefs and expectations. It's also constantly trying to bless us, to source us, to you know, constantly trying to you know show us miracles. And so, the less we do, the more we get out of the way. And the more we let this higher intelligence, you know, take the floor. I mean, one of my things I say every morning is, Holy Spirit, have the floor. I, I call it the Holy Spirit. I'm a student of the Course in Miracles. Um, and so the Holy Spirit would, you know, could also be called the field of infinite potentiality. I think we've gotten too bogged down with all these synonyms over the years. You know, it's caused a lot of division. The truth is, it doesn't really matter what you call it, but there is a force out there that has your best interest at heart and that will help you and guide you if you simply let it. And I hope that listeners, and I, and I know my audience is, is very open-minded, but I hope that people don't take offense to any of this. I mean, you know, I th- think we all know wh- what this is, and we may call it by different names, and I agree with you. It's um, but As long as we understand and we all agree that there is a greater power out there, that we're not in full control. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's the big the big step. And what would you say to somebody, though, who – because i got friends and colleagues who are actually the opposite, at the opposite end of the spectrum, who say – um, they're very skeptical and they say, no, you know, if you're ever going to get something and achieve something, you have to try harder. I mean, it's, it's all on you. I mean, what would you say to that? Oh, well, see, that's such a common belief. And in fact, my follow-up about the E squared, which I think is the one you said you read, it's called EQ, but it talks about the entire world is upside down. In fact, I asked my publisher to actually print it upside down. So when you open the front cover, it would be upside down. They wouldn't do that. They ended up letting me print one page upside down because I'm trying to make the point that most of what we're taught, you know, you've got to work really hard. You've got to put your nose to the grind. So, you know, just that stuff you're talking about, that is how we're taught. That is the dominant paradigm. But the truth of it is this source that wants to bless us and, you know, wants us to be its spokesperson, it, it can be really easy. But again, we're trying so hard and we're working so hard and we're feeling so guilty and, you know, we're following these seven steps and we're doing all this stuff. And it really blocks this incredible force that's always there. So so it's really, um, yeah, it, it's the thing. I mean, most of what we believe is upside down. Most of what we're taught from the time we're little kids. In fact, I was just writing a blog post that I'm getting ready to post about how, you know, we're born and then the minute we're born, we are measured. How, how long are we and how much do we weigh? So from the very moment we're born, we're taught to measure up to these standards. And then it just goes downhill from there, <laughs> you know. But the truth of it is, so nobody tells us that if we follow our joy, that that's God talking to us or the SP or, you know, whatever you want to call it. That's the universe telling you, what do you love? What do you want to do? That's the universe guiding you. People go, oh, nothing guides me. No, that's not true. We've just been taught that nothing guides us and we've been taught that, you know, what we want to do isn't really right. We should be doing this, all the shoulds. You know, we should stop shitting on ourselves, as, as, as the old <laughs> saying goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and I guess one of the, the things that I hear a lot from some skeptics is, well, you can't prove it with science. You know, and I can prove this other thing with science. I mean, what do you say that? Because there is science behind this. I know this sounds uh, a bit abstract, but there is real science behind it. 
There's a lot of science. In fact, um, quantum physics is all about this. And in fact, in quantum physics, they know there's something called the observer effect. There's absolutely impossible to do pure science because every belief and expectation that the scientist doing the research has is playing out in the experiment. So the observer effect is everything that you're looking at, everything you're seeing is actually you're affecting it. We're in this constant dance with what we see. So the person doing the scientific experiment is affecting everything around them. And one of the things about my book, you know, I'm, I love the skeptic because I can say to them, hey, okay, you're, you want to be skeptical? Here's, here's some experiments. Give this a try. And I don't want anybody to take anything on faith. Don't, don't take my word for it. You know, who am I? <laughs> to try it out for yourself. And that's what's kind of cool about these books. And even though they're not um, experiments, but I do have lab report sheets. I mean, they're not experiments like the kind you might, you know, that's being done at universities, although some of them are. But they're just things to see, hey, let's test it out in your own life. Let's try a little science experiment with your own life. Well, let, let's talk about that. So let's talk about the experiments that you have in E squared in, in EQ, both your most recent books. Um, first of all, what's the premise of each book? Uh, it, it, and I assume it's it's very similar. Now, by the way, I think we talked offline. I've read E squared. I have not read E cubed yet. But what's the premise? Yeah, well, the premise is that there is this force that wants to bless us. There is this force that will that is going to guide us. Um, I call it energy. That's where the E squared comes from. Energy squared and energy cubed. But um, And it's a little takeoff on Einstein's E equals MC squared, which, of course, was when we started changing the old Newtonian model that we have no effect. It's all this um, mechanical way. The world wor works in a mechanical way. We now know, we have lots of evidence, that it actually, again, we're interacting a lot with our world, and then our consciousness affects the world. Our beliefs and expectations are, are you know, come back to us and animate what we see in our world. So that's sort of the idea behind it. And and that's kind of a leap for a lot of people. Even though we've known this, we've had, they've changed the entire way we look at science for the last hundred years, but these, these concepts are so different than the way we've been looking at the world that a lot of people aren't fully embracing them. I mean, we've used them to, you know, to blow up, you know, <laughs> to create bombs and to, you know, microwaves, uh, cell phones, technology, all this kind of stuff is using quantum physics. I mean, who'd have thought, you know, a hundred years ago that you could you know, turn on a television set, turn on a little box, and you could watch somebody in another country. You know, I mean, it's just so many of these things. These are all principles we're using, but in our personal lives, we're not necessarily using them. But so what I've done is I've created nine little experiments in both of the books for people to try out. In the first book, they're 48-hour experiments, for the most part. One of them, I think, is a little bit longer. But it's, it's saying, you know, don't take my word for it. Go out and give it, give it a try. And the thing about it is... Um, you know, you can talk about theories all you want, but if you don't put them into practice, if you don't actually see that they work, then what good are they? So it's just a way of getting people to actually try this and see if maybe there is something out there that wants to bless them. Well, let's. Would you mind walking us through maybe two or three of these experiments, and, and so, so folks can actually maybe try some of these ideas? Oh, sure. Well, the first one, which again is kind of what I've been blabbering on about here, is that there is a force. And so what I tell people to do is to note a time and date. And I, as I say in the book now, always works for me and just say, okay, okay, force, if you're out there, you've got 48 hours to make your presence known. And then you just look for a sign or a blessing or something. So you just look for a sign or a blessing. You, you ask, you ask, say, hey, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and see if this crazy Pam Grout girl might have something going on. You know, I don't really believe it, but I'm just going to, you know, just in case, I'm going to go ahead and, and do this. So I ask people to be open-minded, you know, for the 48 hours they're doing the experiment. And I ask them to just, you know, be observant just to see what they see and see if they, anything different comes into their awareness. Because a lot of this about miracles and using this force is about noticing things that you haven't been noticing because we only let into our awareness what we believe, you know, is is true. So it's such, just open your mind for 48 hours and just see if you might see some kind of a sign or blessing or miracle. So that's the first one. It's just real simple. You don't have to do anything. You just have to kind of open your mind and look around. I mean, how simple is that? Yeah, in 48 hours, right? So write the time right. when you decide and then um, just be be on the lookout. And then 40 hours, 48 hours later, I mean, what do you do? So what happens if, if you did, it wasn't something that just kind of hit you right in the face? 
Well, sometimes people will say that they didn't find anything. And then I've, I've actually said, you know, you just need to get really, go out and do something that really is fun and, and do something to kind of get your mind off the worrying and the upset. And then something always will show up. Oh, really, this isn't about training the force or, you know, demanding something the force. It's about training us to pay attention. We're the ones that need to... Um, to start paying attention. It just jars us into looking to all these blessings and miracles that are going out there, all this guidance that's available. So really what it's doing is jarring us into, into noticing because we're, you know, in these little ruts of thinking in our consciousness and we're not noticing all this miraculousness, all this guidance, all these blessings that are right here for us. You know, and it's this is something I've struggled with for a long time. It, my life, my business, there's so much noise going on. I, I, I hardly take time, except when I started meditating briefly in the mornings, uh, I hardly take time to just kind of look around. And the big reminder for me is I have a three-year-old son, and he is so aware. I mean, he'll he'll notice things, and I know you have kids yourself, right? Um, grown, but you you remember, right? When your daughter was young, they see things that we just completely overlook. And I wonder how much is really happening out there that we're completely ignoring. Well, I tell a story in E cubed, and I love this story. It's about a five year old boy who who just you know, has a new baby sister and he keeps bugging his parents. He says, Mom, Dad, I need some alone time with my baby sister, my new baby sister. And they're like, uh, what's going on here? You know, they've read the books about sibling rivalry and they're not sure that he wants alone time. You know, he doesn't want it. So anyway, finally, I mean, he's so persistent. He has to have this time with his baby sister with, without the parents there. So finally they agree, you know, and they stand outside the nursery door and the little boy, you know, walks in there really slowly and he peeks into the bassinet and he goes, Tell me about God. I'm starting to forget. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah, that is so true. I just true. got chills. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's really true. It's, it's one of my favorite stories, and um, I've often told that at some of my talks, and also, like I said, it's an EQ. But, um, but anyway, it's, it's really true. We're taught, we're, we're taught God out of us. You know, we're taught this other way of being, and so we're not paying attention. And you're right. You walk with a little three-year-old, and oh my gosh, they notice everything, every little ladybug and every little spot. In fact, the best advice someone ever gave me when I was you know, giving birth to my one and only child was that instead of me trying to get her to hurry up, hurry up, put your coat on, let's do that, you know, it's just to slow down and go at her pace. And I cannot thank that person enough for telling me that because that was great, great wisdom. You know, kids know a lot of stuff that we, we adults have forgotten. <laughs> they, they do. They do. You know, this time of year, too, I love to watch the Polar Express. Have you ever seen that movie? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. You know, it's, it's symbolic of what we're talking about here, right? The, the fact that as they grow up, they stop hearing the bell. Mm-hmm. And I cry like a baby every time. <laughs> yeah, that is a good movie. I haven't seen that for many, many years. My daughter's 21 now, so, you know, that, that might be a little little beneath her at this point. Although now she's getting to where she'd probably like it again. <laughs> oh, I love, you know, we're all older, and we love that movie in this house. I'll, I'll yeah. watch it every time I get a chance. So it's... Um, it's a great reminder of what we've just been talking about. All right, so that's that's one great experiment. So 48 hours, ask for a blessing, be observant, be on the lookout, and, and you know, see what comes out. So what, what would be another one? Well, the second experiment, if we, I mean, there's a lot of different ones, but the second one is what I call the Volkswagen Jetta experiment. And the first one I call it the Do to Buys, which is a takeoff on the Big Lebowski. I try to make everything kind of fun. My writing is always somewhat entertaining, although some people think it's kind of crazy. It's but, hilarious. I but, love but anyway, that's, that's one of the ways I like to write, and that's how I feel guided to write, but some people, you know, don't like it. But that's, you know, that's different things for different people. But anyway, um, the second one's called the Volkswagen Jetta Experiment, and basically it goes to that idea that, yeah, I said, you know, remember when you, um, you know, you decide you wanted this particular car, and you think, oh, man, it's such a cool car. Nobody else is going to have this car. And so you start looking around, and you realize, wow, everybody has this car. You know, there's, you know, so that, that it's a lot more common than you think it is. So that's why I call it the Volkswagen Jet Experiment. So in that one, I ask people to pick something that's somewhat simple. I mean, there's, there's, a lot of this is about baby steps. You know, it's just like making contact with this force. It's not about, you know, landing a, you know, a brand new, although that's easy to do too, you know, <laughs> moving into a new castle or something. It's just about new, um, doing these baby steps about how, how all this works. 
But anyway, so I ask them to look for something simple like yellow butterflies or a purple feather or just something. I mean, I've had people that decided to look for orange boats or one lady the other day emailed me and said she decided to look for Elvis Presley's and of course she found Elvis Presley's everywhere. One guy sent me an email saying that, how do I turn the clowns off? He decided to look for clowns. (laughs) But basically what you do is just choose something kind of simple and start seeing how many there are out there, like green cars or, you know, whatever it might be. And the principle behind that one is that we draw from that field of infinite potentiality that, you know, that I call the FP in the book, this thing that we proved exists in the first experiment. But the second one is that I draw from that field um, whatever I'm looking for, you know, that my beliefs and expectations impact that field and draw an exact match into my life. So if you start looking for, you know, yellow feathers, you'll see yellow feathers. If you start looking for peace and love, you find peace and love. If you start looking for abundance, you see abundance. So, you know, that's what you eventually get to. But just for the, again, the baby step idea, we, I, you know, pick something really simple and, you know, ask 48 hours, you know, just notice if you see that thing that you're looking for. You know, I tried this again recently and I picked something and I, I, just, I kept thinking cars because that's what you suggested. And you suggested other things, but I kept thinking cars. I said, I'm going to make this a little hard because I don't think they make yellow cars anymore. I said, <laughs> yellow car. And uh, man, that was at night. Next morning, school buses everywhere <laughs> that I don't really notice because I, I mean, I drive my kid to school and I, we're talking and I'm not really paying attention to yellow buses. I'm like, oh, there it is. And I know it sounds silly, but you know what it meant something to me? It does. Well, one lady told me, in fact, if somebody was interviewing me, I don't know, a year ago, a year or so ago, she decided to look for Teslas. You know, that's that really expensive car. I mean, you know, how often are you going to see that? Not only did she see one, she saw an entire, you know, those big trucks that were there carrying, that were carrying all these Teslas, like 10 Teslas across the country. So, you know, it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> that, that really works. So, you know, yeah. That's kind of cool. In fact, any cube, I've got a whole chapter in there with different stories that people have told me about the results from their experiments. I call it, well, duh. <laughs> you know, because a lot of people are like, one of the common things I get at the beginning of an email, you're never going to believe this. Well, no, I will believe this because I happen to know that this, <laughs> this is a real force that actually does work in our lives at all times. We're always using this. It's just that we're using it to notice the same things we've noticed yesterday, to notice the same things we've been programmed to notice from the time we were little. Which goes to the our earlier point, right? That this thing is it's already happening. We just haven't been noticing, right? Exactly. So those things have always been there. The school buses have been there every morning. When when I drive my son to school, it just I hadn't really noticed them. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So, so the Volkswagen Jetta, I like that, and I, I had some great ones. That that that, that, that was the last one with the buses. Let's talk about a, another one. Let's see. One of the ones that has really gotten a lot of. Um, a lot of YouTubes have been made out about it is, I think this is the number three. I mean, it's been a while ago I wrote this book. I mean, but the principle is that you are a field of energy in an even bigger field of energy. So we ourselves are energy. We're not solid matter. We're actually 99.9% space. So anyway, I encourage people to make what I call Einstein wands. And basically it's just a simple coat hanger and some straws. And then, um, you, you turn them into this, it looks like a little laser gun. You take two coat hangers and, and make the thing. And so you, what you do is you hold them out in front of you. And the straws are on the little handles that you've bent over, you know, six-inch handles. And so that keeps you from, you're not actually touching the metal, but you're, you know, holding these. And, and for a while, they will vibrate because, you know, you're, again, we are moving rivers of energy. So anyway, eventually they will settle down as you, you know, breathe and stop that. And so then I ask people to think of a something they're afraid of or some negative thought and then they watch what happens to the wands. I mean, it's just amazing. The wands go in on themselves. And then I say, um, you know, think of some positive thought, something you're excited about, something that makes you jump for joy. And those wands just spread out, you know, just like embracing the world. And if anybody wants to see, you know, YouTubes of these, if you Google my name, Pam Grout and Einstein wands, there's all kinds of YouTubes people have put up you know, all sorts of little <laughs> videos of them doing these Einstein ones. So that's kind of fun. I had a girl the other day tell me that she has renamed them. She calls them magic wands, and she's using them in a in some workshops she's doing with some kids that are um, getting ready to go to the that New York drama school that, that was in that movie Fame. 
Oh, but anyway, so, so yeah, these, these wands have kind of taken off and people are using them all over the place. So that's another fun one. I, you know what? I've tried, I've tried it twice. The first time I tried it, it wasn't doing it. And it's weird. Uh, I, I did this again a few days later and um, I think it, it was a lot quieter and I actually sat down and they did move closer to each other. I mean, like it was very, very, there was no doubt in my mind, very, very close to each other. It, it definitely worked. And it was kind of weird. I had to, if I encourage people to look at the video because I, I was trying to picture what you were describing in the book and I was doing it wrong until I mm-hmm. saw somebody at the video and where the straws were, the shape of these and how to hold them. And uh, it worked. Yeah, it's one of those things that kind of needs diagrams. In fact, that's probably why so many people have put up the videos. Again, this book has just been a huge, you know, bestseller. It's been translated into 34 languages. So, you know, a lot of people have read it. And so a lot of people, you know, want to know how this works. So, it, you know, it's, it's good that um, a lot of my readers did put up the videos to make it easier. And I've got one on my website, too, you know, that people can, can look at as well. So, so tell us about, uh, so there are nine experiments in E-squared. Tell us a little bit about EQ. So this is this seems to be a sequel with more ideas. You, you mentioned there was a lot of success stories from readers. Right. E cubed, um, I call them nine corollaries because I still think the nine principles that I talk about in E squared are the core things that we need to learn that are helpful to learn. Um, but the corollaries um, in E cubed, so again, it's nine more philosophies and nine more experiments. Um, the first one is is the boogie woogie corollary, and that is that the the principle is actually that joy is my natural state. That you know, without this training that we learn from the world, without the mental architecture that we're taught from the time we're tiny, um, joy is your natural state. And so I've got an experiment in there to you know to see is is this true or not because we're so accustomed to looking for problems i mean the number one question is what's wrong i mean we're always looking for a new thing and then we're writing a blog about this problem and then we're joining a support group for this problem but if you start looking for joy you start looking for happiness you realize that's actually your natural state so that's so i call them corollaries i mean again the the nine experiments or the nine principles for me squared are, are again the groundwork or the framework the, the ground whatever you want to call it but um the corollaries in e cubed are you know just more more experiments and more ways to kind of fine tune it in fact i've got a section there called tweak and ye shall find. <laughs> mm. So um, just a little bit about, you know, fine tuning the, some of these ideas. You know, I, and I'm, I'm curious about something that, uh, and I'm, I'm a total beginner with all this stuff. So uh, one of the things that I've heard and read Mike Dooley, I talk about Mike Dooley from Notes of the Universe. Yeah, uh, the he's universe. a friend of mine. He's a great guy. Love yeah. his stuff. And, um, you know, he's always, he's big into, you know, when you ask for something, don't be too specific. So think about the feeling that you would get when you receive that blessing, whatever it might be, physical or non-physical. Um, but, you know, a lot of the experiments that I read were very specific in your book where you were asking or suggesting people look for and ask for very specific things. So, I mean, are these compatible ideas? How, how do you reconcile this? Oh, yeah, they're very compatible. In fact, the way I met Mike Dilley, we just spoke together um, at a conference in London. In fact, I had to follow him, darn it. (laughs) But anyway, um, um, is that, um, you know, thoughts create your reality. I mean, that's what he's all about. That's what I'm all about. So our, our, our things are very similar and kind of what he says, and it's very true is that, um, again, you know, think sometimes into, into the future and sort of get the feeling that you would think about that. Don't obsess about it. Just spend, you know, five minutes a day as pretty much what he would say. And I like to say something very similar, set it and forget it. You know, you just make that intention and then you go, you know, don't think about it because and let the universe do its job. You know, the, the less we get involved, it's like we were talking about with writing. The more we get involved, the more we try to figure it out, the more we try to follow those seven steps you know, the more convoluted it gets. So it's really better to, you know, let it go and, and, and just think about how you'll feel, which is what Mike Dooley would say, you know, when it comes to you. If you're talking about intending, which is, I think, a reason a lot of people get into this sort of thing. They want to make their intentions or their dreams come true. But it's a lot bigger than that. But that's certainly, you know, one, one part of it that definitely appeals to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And so, 
here's where I'm going with this because uh, at any point in time, as you know from being a freelancer, you know you'll hit rough patches, right? And uh, you'll you'll do well, and suddenly you'll you're you're just wondering where the next client is going to come from, and you know nothing you're doing seems to be working. Kind of coming back to the freelance world with the advice you shared with us here, you know, what would you tell someone who might be having a difficult time right now? And they're trying, they they feel like they're doing everything they should be doing. They're not sure what else to do, and they're really getting scared. And fear is kind of taking over. What would you say to somebody like that? Well, the fear can certainly block the universe. You know, fear, guilt, all the different emotions that we have can certainly block this goodness. In fact, I would say that's the only thing that can block this goodness um, that wants to come to you. Um, but I would say to try to get into, again, a good feeling state and to try to um, think about how they'd feel, you know, when whatever it is they're trying to get would come to them and to do something that makes them happy, to, to come, kind of forget about it and to say it's okay. I always talk about those are the two magic words, it's okay. No matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're thinking, no matter what you're going through, it's okay. And once you can kind of get into that ease of it's okay, whatever it is, then the other thing can kind of come into play because what happens is when we start blaming ourselves and beating ourselves up, we block this incredible goodness that wants to come to us. So when things are not, when things are appearing um, as they're not working out, that's how it appears. You've got to take your attention off what appears. You know, like my blog post yesterday is what is is not nearly as important as what could be, you know, to focus more on the possibilities instead of focusing on what is. Because what is is only here because we continue to focus on that and continue to fear for that and continue to worry about that. So the more you can get your attention off of that, what seemingly is, and get it on to, you know, what could be possible, you know, I mean, the, the sooner the, the good stuff can start flowing in. I think that is so true. Did I think going back to Mike Dooley, he has a story about the GPS, and you're going somewhere you've never been to before, so you program it in the GPS, and um, it, it the whole time during the trip, it you have no idea where you are uh, up until you get there, right? So, would you say that during your trip you were on the wrong path? No, it's just you couldn't see the destination, you couldn't see it manifest yet. Until right, you exactly. Yeah, I love that story of Mike's. <laughs> That's a good one. So, and that's that's very encouraging. I'm glad you shared that with us because I, I think this is a very common thing out there. And sometimes I'm at a loss for words when people come to me and say, Ed, I'm I, I have no idea what else to do, you know? And um it, it's I think that's the point where you have to surrender. And I, I love what you said about fear and, and how it can block. So I'm curious about one thing as we wrap up, you know, you, number one New York Times bestseller, E Squared, E Cubed is I'm sure doing very, very well. I mean, is this something that you that you asked for? Um, is this something you envisioned? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I put a last or New Year's Eve twenty thirteen, the book E Squared came out on um, January twenty eighth. So on New Year's Eve I was out visiting my sister in Savannah, Georgia. So she we went out to the New Year celebration on Tybee Island. So I was at a beach and so I took a big stick and I wrote into the beach in big block letters, E squared will be an international bestseller. And then I let the waves come in and take it out to the world. So uh, two things happened there. First of all, I didn't do anything about it. I mean, you know, everybody said, oh, you should market, you should do this, you should do that. No, I let the universe do it. I simply wrote it in the beach and let the waves take it out. And that's pretty woo-woo for a lot of people. But to me, that solidifies my belief is that, you know, I'm unable to do it. Me by myself, not uh, not so much. <laughs> but with the help of the, the this big universal energy with this higher intelligence, this field of infinite potentiality, um, of magical things can happen. So I said it and I forget it. You know, I said it and forgot it. Said it and forget it sounds better. Said it and forgot it. But <laughs> said it and forget it. And then, you know, the waves came in and took it out. And again, like I said, it's been translated into 34 languages. It has become a big international bestseller. So, um, so yeah, a lot of it is just be easy about it. Just let it be. So yes, I did make that intention. Um, I've, you know, oh, in fact, I, I've got a little thing, and if anybody wants to Google this, my name, and let the universe do the heavy lifting, is this book that became this huge success. I had written it eight years earlier. It came out as another book with a different publisher, and it did nothing. It, you know, went into the sea of literary has-beens. How it was called, God Doesn't Have Bad Hair Days. 
How, <laughs> however, what I didn't do is get all upset about it. Again, it's like, okay, I, I wrote three books for National Geographic. I you know, went on and just was happy about my life. And I, what I say in this blog post is once my joy channels were open, once I really got it that, you know, this force is trying to bless me, that, you know, that love is true, that there is this force of blessings and miracles, and I got happier, then all this stuff came rushing to me. The book, you know, went off and became this big hit. But it was the same book I'd written eight years ago when maybe I was worrying and fearful and, you know, not, I mean, I don't know that I was worrying and fearful, but I wasn't as happy as I am now, let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, I've really started working on what's really most important is to feel good, is to, to be happy, to enjoy life. Well, I, I'm honored that you came on today. This is, again, a message that we all need to hear. And um, it's a great reminder for me. You know, I, I tend to forget about this stuff as I go about my day. So thank you very much. And before we sign off, where can you mentioned your blog? Where can listeners learn more about you your, your, and your books? Um, well, pamgrat.com, that's my website. That's a good place. My books are available pretty much at any bookstore. Right now, I don't know if this airs right now, but um, $1.99 at the, at the Amazon Kindle store, or both E Squared and E Cube, which is you know a great bargain. I mean, they're not always that price, but Hay House, my publisher, is doing a special right at the moment. So, anyway, if this happens to be running, airing, whatever, right now, this is a good time to go get the books for $1.99 a piece. Um, but anyway, there at any bookstore, pamgrat.com is my website, and that's my blog's on there. So that's a good place to find me. That's great. So yeah, we're, uh, we're pre-recording this, and hopefully, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks this will run. Hopefully, this will still be the case. But guys, I got to tell you, and you know me, I don't review a lot of books. I don't bring a lot of authors on the show. This is absolutely worth it, even at full price. This will really get you thinking and rock your world. So th- thanks again, Pam. This was a great, great talk. Yeah, thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview and I have a little confession for you. You know, getting Pam to reply to my request to be on the show and getting her on the show was actually a little experiment, a little thought experiment that I tried. I thought it'd be really neat to apply one of her experiments to this intention and see if it manifested. And I never shared that with her, but I wanted to let you guys know Look, it worked. Here's an international best-selling author who agreed to come on the show. This is uh, this hasn't happened before. Not that I've that I've really tried contacting other international bestsellers. I've had some amazing people on the show. Some people that are very hard to uh, to to get on any show. But um, Pam's was an interesting one just because of uh, the fact that I I used some of what she taught uh, to get her to to agree to to come on. So. Uh, anyway, really interesting stuff. I, I hope you enjoy it and I hope you get some value from it. And listen, try this stuff out. I can't emphasize this enough. Try it. Believe it will happen. Give it some time. Give it those 48 hours in these experiments. And I encourage you to grab her books. Uh, I, they, they really are amazing. You can grab the detailed show notes for this episode at b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 66. And I just have one announcement before I sign off today. Today is your last chance to grab my comprehensive home study program for launching your B2B writing or copywriting business faster and with less risk. It's called B2B Launch Igniter. And after today, it's going to be gone forever. I'm I'm not relaunching it again. And it's not because it's outdated. In fact, I just published it a few months ago. I'm taking it down because I've decided to roll the material into a much more expensive, much more comprehensive training program. And I can't have a competing program that costs so much less out there in the market. So anyway, if you've been thinking about grabbing it, today is the last chance. So hopefully you're listening to this today, December 18th. If not, you know, I apologize. Um, starting tomorrow, you won't be able to get it anywhere at any price. And to be clear, because some people have asked, if you grab it today or if you've grabbed it this week, you have lifetime access to the program material once you enroll. Uh, so once you know, you, you, you can go through the material at your own pace. The only thing that will expire tonight is your ability to enroll. I'm also throwing in a nice little bonus with some interaction and coaching time with me if you uh, sign up this week. And the link to learn more will be in the show notes, but let me give it to you here, b2blaunchigniter.com forward slash last chance. So b2blaunchigniter.com forward slash last chance. And igniter is T-O-R at the end instead of T-E-R. So that brings us to the end of the episode. I am your host, Ed Gandia. Thanks so much for listening. 
and I hope you have an awesome day. The High Income Business Writing Podcast is a production of B2B Business Launcher. Learn more at b2blauncher.com.